morning and welcome to the Farmingdale High School District's annual Wall of Fame induction ceremony. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the Wall of Fame started in 1998. It represents a very talented group of men and women who have been first responders, veterans, educators, chefs, doctors, entertainers, artists, business owners, and so much more. All are excellent role models who have shown us that with hard work and determination, we can turn our passion into a successful career. Hi, good evening, everybody. And welcome, my name is Jed Herman. I am one of the assistant principals here at Farmingdale High School. Additionally, I serve as the chairperson of the Wall of Fame Selection Committee. I am pleased to be joined on stage this evening by two wonderful students and members of our committee. Tonight we have Ms. Asan el Minabawi and Mr. Christopher Bergeson, and they will take us through tonight's presentation. graduating in 1975 with a degree in elementary education. Ms. Diorio led an active social life in the halls of FHS. She was always a part of creating the scenery of school shows, and you could often find her in the auditorium painting the sets. She was an exceptional math student, but excelled in every subject she partook in. Linda was all, an all-around daler. Even her two sons graduated from Farmingdale High School. She stayed close in the community through her sons and developed a wide array of continuing friendships. As Linda grew from, F, uh, grew from FHS to college to marriage and to motherhood, she faced one of the biggest challenges anyone could ever face. She lost her son, beloved son, Eric, to drug addiction in 2008. But as the strong woman she was, she turned this pain into life. Ms. Diorio presented at school events and public forums in which she would share her family story Eric's tragedy was featured in the Newsday in 2008 and 2009. In the paper, Linda commented, it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village to join together to work for change to protect them. Linda closely worked with the head of Nassau Alliance for Addiction Services. In November of 2008, Linda spoke at a conference held by the Alliance to promote a new campaign, which was a website in hopes of raising awareness to help resources for drug and alcoholic she, she would attend wakes with other mothers who were coping with the same loss as she did and provide aid to grieving families. Overall, Linda was a shining example of what the kind person students at FHS should aspire to be like. Through, ver through every hardship, she was able to make a difference and make everyone around her proud. We are lucky enough to be able to continue to shine Linda's life through the eyes of her loving husband, John DiOrio, 
as well as her wonderful twin sister. We sadly lost Linda in 2020, but her life will continue to shine through FHA. Linda adopted a saying and lived this idea throughout her life. We make a living by what we get, and we get make a life by what we give. Thank you. Mrs. Yorio was nominated by Tina Alessi Kukowski. Um, Nancy Harris and Mr. Diorio, please come up and accept this plaque on behalf of the entire Farming Girls School community. As, you, as, as mentioned, Linda sadly passed away uh, from a very quick but valiant fight with pancreatic cancer. She lived from 1953-2020, um, and I'm going to share with you the life of this remarkable woman from Farmingdale and her quest to help our children battling with addiction. I'll start by sharing with you my personal relationship with Linda. She was my closest friend, and we met in March 2009, three months after the death of my daughter, Caitlin Krakowski, who died in a tragic car accident on Main Street in Farmingdale. Linda sent me a card with much needed encouragement, encouraging words, and I reached back out to her, and that's when our journey together began. Linda had lost her oldest son, Eric Diorio, six months prior to Caitlin's um, passing. And Eric, but Eric had passed away six months prior to Caitlin um, when he was battling a daunting battle with the opioid and heroin addiction. Eric and Caitlin were friends, both graduated in 2007. They were both embarking on new adventures, which were robbed from them at the young age of 19. Linda and I shared equal sorrow, but Linda took hers on a brave new quest. She was determined to save the lives of our Farmingdale kids, who she knew, in, or even later found out, were addicted to heroin. She and I spent much of our time visiting Eric and Caitlin at St. Charles. Our kid, kids were buried near each other in an empty section. Within just two year, short years, that section became filled with teenagers. Many of them were from farm India, and almost all died from heroin overdose. Linda easily became a magnet to everyone she encountered. Her patient understanding, words of encouragement, and her knowledgeable advice was profound. I witnessed multitudes of people calling her daily about where to find help for the children, and Linda always knew the answers. <coughs> but if in doubt, she Googled. <laughs> she'd research and she'd find an answer. Linda was one of the first people to be televised, not once, but multiple occasions, to talk out publicly about heroin addiction and her child. At that time, many parents lived in silent agony, not willing to to conceal the fact that their child died from heroin. Many felt shame or guilt, but not Linda. Linda was determined to share her journey to save kids' lives and to tell her story. I'm quite sure that she saved the lives of many grieving parents as well in that process. 
I actually know firsthand that you did. I'd like to share with you now a few testimonies um, from our Farmingdale kids. First one is from a young lady. Her name is Gina Marie Gallucci. I don't know if she was supposed to be here eventually. Linda, this is Gina Marie's work. Linda was a phenomenal woman. She always made sure to stop and have a conversation whenever I saw her. Ah. She supported me tremendously when I was struggling to get clean. When I had gathered some clean time, she had me speak at one of her own anniversaries, which meant so much to me that she truly believed in me throughout everything. Linda always offered a bit of advice and well wishes. There were many moments I can look back on that Linda helped push me through. She just wanted everyone to succeed and be the best versions of themselves. Linda helped so many people in the Farmingdale community. From the time we were little kids, all of us, she followed so many of us through our journey into adulthood to make sure to keep in touch with us. She was beyond strong, going through every parent's worst nightmare and then helping so many of us to try to find our way. She made sure to walk with me through the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. She always reached out and she quickly went from being Eric's mom to being a friend. I am glad I was one of the lucky people to have Linda as a friend. Gina, would you stand up, honey? Thank you. Um, this one is a little, next one is a little more emotional. Um, it's from a, a young man. His name is Steve Burton. He can't be here today. He's missing my But Steve wrote, um, my name is Steve uh, Burton, and I am in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. I have not felt the need to use drugs or alcohol since June 2014. My recovery has allowed me to be a son, brother, uncle, father, and husband. I graduated from Farmingdale High School with the class of 2007. When I was at Farmingdale, I was the type of student who constantly got into trouble. I was always getting suspended. Um, I was asked to become a student in the PAGE program. From there, I was told at the end of my 10th grade that, um, that it would be required that I either attend night school or another school. I was the type of kid many people gave up on. I'm writing you to tell you about someone who never judged me, who was always there for me, who was one of the biggest cheerleaders through my trials and tribulations, Linda DiOrio. She was, not, she was just a wonderful mother to her own children. Not just a wonderful mother, but she was an exceptional mother to the children in the Farmingdale community. There was a certain chain of events that would set Linda on a path in her life that was not expected. On a warm July night, I had got a call that one of my childhood best friends was no longer with us. I remember being in denial about this and getting into my car to speak to his house. As I pulled up, I saw a lot of my friends from the neighborhood. Then I saw the police cars. As I frantically stopped my car and got out, I could see my friend's little brother, Chris. I shouted past the officers to Chris and asked what happened, and he said, he is gone. He then ran into the house. I asked the officers where Eric was, and they told me that he was on his way to the house. I got back into my car and made my way to the hospital. As we waited outside the hospital in tears, it all seemed not to be real. Finally, I saw Linda coming out of the emergency room. As she approached, I could see that she was clearly a wreck. She came to me, hugged me, and said, I thought you didn't want to lose any another friend. I remember this vividly because as she did it, did this, I felt as if I was holding Linda up, as if her legs gave out. And in that moment, she felt grief and See, a month or two previously, Eric did try to get help. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. They, they knew Eric had a problem and had been quietly working to get him to help him. Unfortunately, 
Dave did were working with the to his tragic demise. Since Eric's death, Linda had really devoted her life to helping others in the farm community. She constantly reached out to children who were struggling, as well as trying to offer support to their parents. I remember when I had got back from rehab, Linda told me where and what time I could get to an AA meeting. She would constantly reach out via the phone, text, Facebook to make sure I was doing well. I know now that the reason Linda did these things with the hopes that maybe she could prevent another Farmingdale family from going through what she went through. I know of a few other people she did the same thing for. I know Linda played a big role in helping another Farmingdale High School student recover from an attempted suicide that put them in a coma, in a, in a coma for days. That person is doing well today and is a wonderful mother to her children. See, Linda did not only affect those she affect those she directly helped, she also positively affected their children. So he lives in Florida, he has four kids, and he has a great career in finance. As I now reflect on Linda's life, I think she also got to see one of her sons grow up vicariously through me. Seeing just one life change for the better and preventing another child from being lost and preventing another mother from the heartache she experienced made it all worth it for her. Wow, that was some pretty powerful stuff. Thank you, Steve Perkins. Now, so Linda, Linda had a, a couple catchphrases. Um, I'm so grateful that I'm, that, that this induction is here and that Linda will forever be in the future minds of our Farmingdale youth and families via the Farmingdale Hall of Fame. So her quotes were, there are no coincidences, you gotta laugh, and it takes a village. Last, last list. These are not my words, these are Linda's words. It's all about the dash. The life you lived, the friendships you made, the love you gave, the laughter we shared, and all the cherished memories of what made you, you. Thank you for listening. Speaking on Linda's behalf will be Ms. Harris. Good evening. My name is Nancy Pantaleo Harris, and Linda Fiorio is my younger sister. If Linda could be with us tonight, she would be grateful and humbled to be included on this wall of faith. On behalf of Linda's husband, John, her son, Chris, and all of us in the extended Diorio and Pantaleo families, thank you to Tina and to the committee for honoring Linda in this profoundly moving way. When Tina first approached me about nominating Linda for the Wall of Fame, my initial reaction was to wonder how or why she would qualify for such a distinguished honor. I thought the Wall of Fame honored alumni prestigious professional careers to influence our high school students. Linda was not an astronaut, a business executive, or a lawyer. Linda had careers in teaching and later in banking, which she left in 1989 when her son Eric was born. I wondered if those credentials were enough for the Wall of Fame. Then I thought about it some more. Permit me to step back to explain our upbringing which forms the foundation for the person Linda became and why we are here tonight. My sister, brother, and I were raised by a single father, widowed when we were young children. Our dad was a blue collar worker in the printing industry. He commuted to Manhattan, sometimes worked 14 to 16 hour days, and then commuted home in the middle of the night because he had to sign our homework. He would 
would sleep four hours and then turn around to do it all over again. The four of us were a tight unit. Dad was always beside us. Chief cheerleader or chief supporter through every triumph or tragedy that beset us as we grew up. You see, Dad made it a priority to take care of his family. <coughs> through his example, his enduring message to us throughout his life was to take care of each other. Fast forward to adulthood. Linda moved away from Farmingdale for a few years, but she and John ultimately bought a house and raised their family here. Linda was an involved mom in her two boys' lives in Farmingdale schools and sports. She became active in making Farmingdale a safer place to live, such as successfully campaigning for a stop sign at the intersection of Motor Avenue and Vanderwater Street when Stop and Shop opened. But that was not to be Linda's ultimate, most influential public voice. After the life-altering tragedy of her 18-year-old son, Eric's death, Linda found her public mission that my dad had prepared us for, to take care of each other. Linda adopted a wider family to take care of. Her expanded family were Eric's friends, classmates, and all teens who were at risk because they struggled to find direction just as Eric did. This was all very personal for Linda. Linda couldn't save Eric, nor could she replace him, but she was gonna find ways to reach out to other kids like him. And when the parents of those kids needed support and encouragement, Linda was there for them too. Although Linda passed away from cancer in 2020, her influence lives on in those teens and their parents who heard her messages and those students who were awarded those scholarships. Like a bell that reverberates repeatedly in ever wider acoustic arcs, Linda's legacy embodies what it means to take care of each other. Now I know why Linda earned her place on the wall of fame. My sister Linda is still and always will be the strongest and most influential person I know. Thank you again. to introduce you to Isabella Athanasio, um, our paper liar journalist, who will introduce our second nominee, Daniel Kornfeld. Says he is honored to be receiving this award and he hopes it inspires. 
inspire students to get involved in their community in school and after graduating. Thank you. Mr. Cornfield was nominated by Thomas Sabellico. Please welcome him to the stage. I've heard him yell. Okay, part is not getting up. Can you hear me about this? Yes? Okay. So, good evening, uh, Superintendent Deputini, uh, Dr. Thompson, administrators, board members. Uh, honorees, their families, and friends. It's my pleasure and honor to join you tonight and to introduce our next inductee, Dan Cornfield. I've known Dan for more than 20 years, have been brought together by a common passion, coaching youth baseball. We've worked closely together on many community projects over those years, so nominating him for this honor was a natural and easy thing to do. And understandably, the committee that makes the final selection agreed with me and acknowledged Dan's many contributions to this community. The Hall of Fame, or a Wall of Fame, serves to bring together the past and the present. As we take the time and the opportunity to recognize those we deem to be the best of the best, we also give current students and families a blueprint for success. But an important lesson for all of us to learn is that no two people's blueprints are identical, nor is their timeline. Although you will find common elements or characteristics, by analogy, every type of building or home constructed starts with a possibility, an idea, and then a blueprint. And each takes a different amount of time to be completed. When done, they all look different. Different sizes and shapes, different number of stories, different roof styles, etc. Yet, each has a foundation, each has a front door, each has windows, and each has a heat source. Similarly, Dan Cornfield's blueprint for success, which led him from being a student here at FHS in the late 70s to having his plaque hang in the Farmingdale Wall of Fame, is different than that of others on the wall. Dan wasn't the president of his class or the editor of the high school newspaper. He wasn't the football team starting quarterback or the lead in the school play. He wasn't the prom king or the class valedictorian. <clears throat> he didn't seek or need that external <laughs> validation of his worth. What he was, was a dad, a true friend, <clears throat> a great teammate, a guy who gave you his word and stood by it. He was the guy you wanted to go to battle with, the guy you wanted in your foxhole, the guy who would always have your back. So, although Dan's blueprint to succeed as a human being, whose life has served to make farming a better place to live, is different than others, all the basics are there for us to learn from. He had a foundation. He had great role models, working class, hard working parents, who instilled in him a sense of community and caring. A mother from whom he inherited what Dan and I call charity. He has windows. He has a pair of eyes that are observant and understanding. They have great peripheral vision, allowing him to see the bigger picture of what's good for the community. They provide a sense of what situation needs help and attention. <clears throat> he has a front door. He possesses a unique openness that tacitly invites others to communicate and relate with him, allows them to enter his world, and allows him to enter theirs, to help in whatever way necessary. And he has a heat source. Within him exists an oversized heart that generates the heat and energy to accomplish what he sees as necessary and good. Others may see a need and pass it by. Some may give a passing attempt to help. Dan puts his heart into overdrive, sinks his teeth into the situation, and doesn't let go until the problem is solved. In telling Dan's story, I'm reminded of two quotes from Golda Meir, the Ukrainian-born former Prime Minister of Israel. The first is, there are those who love you, and then there are those who love you and show up. Dan is the latter. He loves you, and he shows up. Just like he showed up for Farming Their Baseball, PAL, Farming Their Community Summit, Farming Their Chamber of Commerce, <coughs> Winning Beyond Winning, Last Week of Farming Their Men's Club, John Thiessen Children's Foundation, 
Nassau County Police Commissioners Community Council, just to name a few. Golden Meteor's second quote, which tells you how to implement your own private blueprint, is make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into flames of achievement. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Mr. Daniel Kornfeld, please come up and accept this plaque on behalf of the entire Farmingdale School community. Senior citizen. She spent 30 years 
uh, with the seniors. I grew up helping and being with all types of people and constantly witnessing herself and Shirley assisting at any time at, at night. There are a few other people that I have to mention that set me on my way for community service. Sid Peck was a Pony League president when, uh, when I was 17. He recruited his son, myself, Mr. Kirk over there, um, to umpire. And then made us coaches and managers. So at 18, I was coaching 13 and 14 year old kids. Uh, some that I worked with, one just retired from the town with me after 30 years. I coached him when he was 14. When you're 18 and the kid is 13, that's a big difference. When you're 50 and you're 55, there's no difference there. And, uh, it was an amazing uh, journey. Um, in a few years, Sid made me VP and then retired, leaving me as president of Pony League at 23 years old. Uh, I'll get him someday for that. But uh, um, I did it for a couple years, not having any kids in the program. Uh, it was even crazier back then. I did my time, and then I started my marketing career. I had to take a step back, but I vowed that I'd be back in the future. That future happened when Ian and Tori turned four. I joined PAL, FBLI as a coach manager. Then it both became a director. Actually, Mr. Kirk, I'm glad you're here because he was a gentleman that first recruited me to be an assistant director. So I don't know if I should be mad at you too. But, um, and then uh, became a director and then a board member. And then joining Farmingdale Baseball introduced me to some wonderful people. My two Tom Toms, I call them. Tom Fusaro was my predecessor as, as treasurer. He trained me and instilled his kids first attitude in me. We lost him way too soon, but, it, but his impact he had on me stays to this day. That brings me to the other very special Tom and the reason for me being up here, Tom Spelko. Tom was president of FBLI when I joined the league. When I joined the board, it was him who took me under his wing. I was amazed at the size of his heart and his amazing acumen for running things. We spent countless hours over the years. I learned how to run an organization, deal with the insane pressure of crazy parents, associates, and the community. We always got through it, hard work, sweat, definitely some tears, but with laughter. It was a pleasure and still is to work with him. He too, I'm not sure if I should thank or give a shot to the head, but uh, anyway, he started the Farming Duck Community Summit after 9-11, the community needed it, Tom was there. He formed this amazing organization. I came along, and then, of course, within a year, I became treasurer. Then he introduced me to Wouldn't It Be On Winning, firefighters, to name a few. The chamber, I did on my own. Helping farming no businesses went hand in hand with helping other charities. It just made sense. Uh, on a whim, sp sitting in a restaurant with the mayor of Farmingdale and Councilman Muscarella, um, we said, well, Farmingdale has a women's club that's been around for 100 years. How come we don't have a men's club? <laughs> Lo and behold, the Farmingdale Men's Club was conceptualized. Then we had to bring in Massapequa, so we became the Massapequa Farmingdale Men's Club. The MF is for sure. Um, <laughs> hard to believe it's five years already, huh, Tom? Uh, we've assisted families, veterans, and just tried to cheer community members up during some difficult times. I take great pride in the work that we've done with all the organizations, and I would not be up here if it wasn't for the amazing people that I work with. Some of the best people I know were on the boards of these organizations. It was always a team effort, and I share this award with my many friends who have been with me over the years. And I'm amazed, and I wasn't nervous if you guys showed up, but my childhood friends from high school, the fact that they're still allowed in here, I don't uh, understand. Bob Kirk, John Kelly, and Luke Capone, uh, George Graff, uh, the prior mayor of uh, Farmingdale, some other friends that I know came down to see me. I'm honored for that. Uh, I share this award with them. Um, but front and center, Tom, thank you again uh, for molding me into uh, what I am. Uh, when I look at the group of people I joined on the wall, I'm humbled. Doctors, first responders, military, all occupations, all walks of life, all different reasons. What I'm most proud of is my induction is the community service. Uh, I hope it's an inspiration to the young people of any age to get involved, join a group, or two or three. You can always help someone in some way. There was no better feeling than being able to do that. Um, and to close, and it's funny that it was already said, but I had written this before you came up with it. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So thank you very much.
Now we would like to introduce you to Sarah Tremendi, our student journalist who will be writing about Dr. Neil Strickland. to me, so I'm letting you know. He blew me off. <laughs> so after compiling information from his son Tim, who's here today, uh, I submitted the dossier to Mr. Herman, and ultimately I received a call from Mr. Herman telling me that the submission for Dr. Strickman was successful. And should he call Dr. Strickman, or should I? I said, I'll. So I called the doctor and told him that the submission had been successful. And he said, it's about time. <laughs> <sighs> Dr. Strickman did not go to an Ivy League school. His, his family did not come from wealth but he was one of the most competitive human beings I have ever met. <laughs> Case in point, Neil and I coached Little League for a long time. We had 13 and 14 year olds one year, and our team was the Astros. And it was the last inning with the bases loaded, and Frank Friedman was coming to bat. Frank was a great kid, tall, gangly. Baseball player, he was not. So Neil's on the third baseline, and he calls him down. He calls Frank down from the, uh, the batter's box. And he whispers in his ear, and Frank smiles as he goes down to first base. I, well, I ruined that story. <laughs> OK, all right. So uh, Frank, okay. yeah, so Frank, he calls up Frank over says something to him, what can it be? He goes back to the batter's box with a big smile on his face. And I said, Neil, what did you tell him? And he said, 
I told them to get hit by a pitch. <laughs> <laughs> to which I almost fainted, as you can understand. That, that, we won. We beat the Dodgers. That was the name of the team. Wherever Gary Bartolucci is, he was our star. Dr. Strickman has, pre has performed over 1,700, tra 1700 transcatter aorta valve replacements. Do you know what that is? Yes. Not a yeah. <laughs> But the doc has famously <laughs> performed this uh, procedure more than anybody else in the country and maybe in the world. <coughs> Let me tell you. I want to tell you something. A couple of weeks ago, I went to a wedding in New York City, and most of the people there were from Farmingdale High School. And the common conversation was how lucky we were to go to this high school, where we remained friends for more than 50 years. So with that said, I want to introduce you to the world famous Dr. Neil Strick. Thank everyone for coming. This is really a great crowd. There's almost as many people here as uh, the Yankee game we went to Sunday. <laughs> uh, being a Farmingdale graduate, uh, I'm just glad to see so many uh, people here. So uh, Eddie and I and my son came into town a few days ago in Manhattan, and we got here to Farmingdale last night, and I was listening to the radio, and I really heard this bizarre boat show of something going on uh, in, on the Long Island Sound. And it was the following what I heard. The Farmingdale Dalers said, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. And the Massapequa Chief said to we recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avert the collision. Well, this started a little fight uh, between this. And what ensued? As the Farmingdale Dailers said, negative, sir, you must divert your porch 15 degrees to the south. The chief, this is the captain of the ship, and I say again, you have got to divert your porch. Well, now there's a heated discussion, and I'm listening to this. I mean, I, I, I can't believe I'm listening to this. And the Dailers again say, no, nope, you have got to divert your porch. And the Massapequa chief said, we've sustained, we substituted our boat for the largest ship available USS Chief were accompanied by multiple cruisers, support vessels, so I again, I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north, I again, 1, 5 degrees north, or we will ensue countermeasures. So I'm listening, and then I hear the phone. The farmer down there will say, okay, well, have it your way, it's a lighthouse, it's your way. <laughs> and with this, I start to tell you a little bit about my life and what I do. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and I graduated in 59. I finished my fellowship in Houston in 1982. I'm a board certified interventional cardiologist, and many of you as a room have seen a cardiologist for one reason or another, and I was there when the Texas Heart Institute started uh, in Houston, Texas. So I'd like to uh, divide this 10-minute talk into the following. Greetings, my work ethic, timeline, the year 1969, and then some closing remarks. And I'd like to thank Jed Herman, who uh, we've had some re uh, relations with over the past month. He's been a great host here. Those of you that see your name on there, you had something to do uh, with either the Board of Education or getting us here. Uh, my wife, Karen, and my children, Scott, Steph, and Tim. Everybody that's <coughs> watching this back home on Zoom and around the world, I have many friends there. The audiovisual and custodial staff, and those who have helped me. Uh, Martha has been just great. Sarah for tonight, and Eddie uh, likes to man. So, this is my work. 
How did I get to where I am today? I am born in 51 in Brooklyn. I moved to North Massapequa in 56. I went to Albany Avenue in 58. Weldon E. Howard in 63. Farmingdale High School in 66. Graduated in 1969. I went to Sunny Buffalo, graduated in 73. Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse in 77. And then I moved to Texas. I did my internship residency, my cardiology fellowship. I've been in the same group since 1982, same position. And then we sold our practice to the Baylor College of Medicine. I am in the same position, same group. Some of the elders have passed on, and now I am the CEO of the group. But I've been to 31 different countries where I have taught cardiology. Everything I do here in the US, I have done elsewhere. I'm proud that in the early 80s, I taught peripheral vascular intervention to multiple Asian countries. As you can see there, there I am in China. I've been to China 25 times already. There are some pictures of me in different places. Uh, Kuala Lumpur with the great Petronas Towers, my friends in the cath lab, and then some of the typical headdress that they wore in these countries. Here I am at the Great Wall of China, then I'm here in Japan. I've eaten this uh, fruit that they have in Malaysia that is the worst smelling taste you've ever had. <laughs> I caught a picture of it. I am lucky to own, be a part owner of the scuba dive shop in Bali, Indonesia, called Bali Scuba Masters, and there I am outside the famous duck place in uh, China. Again, lecturing in every place. Here we are in uh, India, and again, uh, the Buddha in Thailand, and then uh, my friends at the Asia International Conference. I've also been to all these European countries, many of them over, again, the past uh, 40 years. Here I am trying to get arrested by the police in the Netherlands. There's a picture of me lecturing in Maastricht, which is a famous educational center in Amsterdam. Here I am on the cliffs of uh, Slovenia. Uh, there's um, the uh, French Riviera, uh, and then, of course, uh, in uh, Britain, with the McDonald's sign. I've been to South America multiple times. I've been to Machu Picchu. If you're thinking of uh, going there, you better take oxygen. It's a long way up to the top. Uh, and there, it's always sort of dark and dank, but it's uh, just a great area of the world. Here again, in, uh, I have ceviche, which is the uh, great dish of the Peruvians, and then Malbec's uh, in Argentina. I've also been to the Middle East. I've been to Dubai at least a dozen times. Uh, they have some uh, great large buildings there, and many friends. I have been to uh, Egypt as well. Uh, to, uh, so I've traveled to multiple places. But some of the claims to fame for me are what Eddie meant, which is tavern. And what that stands for is transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Those of you who've had mothers, fathers, brothers who've had surgery, who have their aortic valve replaced, we can now do it without surgery. I've done over 2,000 of these uh, with this valve. It's all done through transcatheter uh, therapy. I've also performed over 2,000 carotid artery stents. These are the procedures to prevent stroke in patients that have a blockage uh, in their uh, neck artery. And then the doctors say it's a miracle you survive so long with such severe carotid artery stenosis, but unfortunately, your insurance company doesn't cover you. We tend to do a lot of patients which do not have insurance. That's just the way we take care of patients. It really doesn't make a difference to us. The hospital can us, but we as doctors don't care. My other claim to fame is performing aortic aneurysm surgery, again, without surgery. This is called EBAR or endovascular aortic replacement, and I've done also some other accomplishments in my 40 years, I've been very lucky. I trained and graduated over 286 cardiology fellows, offered 150 medical papers, taking care of over 100,000 patients in the office for a hospital. I've designed five different catheters that are still in use today by cardiologists. I've been to over 400 worldwide meetings. I was voted outstanding teacher five times, and I had two hole-in-ones, not bad for me. <laughs> My timeline of events. These are the early days. School, my bar mitzvah, I'm all here. And then my mother with my two kids who are now 36 and 38. And then, uh, luckily, we were able to go by my old house today. I was able to capture a picture. It doesn't look anything like what I remember 
in, in the 50s, but it's still standing in the street on North Kentucky Avenue. Uh, uh, Jimmy Emlock lived right there. <laughs> Some of the school years, the senior and I at the junior prom, Eddie and I with the baseball team. Gary Bartolucci is here tonight, probably doesn't recognize himself, our pitcher. And one for us, one of the famous who's passed is uh, uh, Dick Armour. Dick supported Eddie and I when we had long hair. <coughs> uh, they wanted to throw us out of the league for teaching the kids, and we had great baseball team. Yeah. Dick, Dick always uh, stood by our side. The Bad Days, my uh, first band with Frank Finelli, who's here tonight. Frank is the lead guitar player in the middle, once with long hair, once without. And then uh, one at the side, which has our drummer, bass player. Uh, Mark Newman is here tonight also, and the Bubster, my second band, Transverse Gallery. I don't have that picture, but I have to find it. The college years, my brother, five years older than me. Uh, there I am in Buffalo. Again, this is during the Vietnam War areas. A little bit of long hair. Uh, one month a year, there's still in Buffalo. My work years, Dr. Hall, my senior associate in his path. My secretary, Alice, who's been there 42 years, 40 with me, and then uh, congratulating me for uh, my birthday. And then my family, these are my parents uh, who have passed away, and my wife's parents, all who have passed away. My wife uh, congratulating us for tonight, and uh, my presence is gone. More of the family, this is my son with his wife, and our first and only grandchild, soon to have a second. Uh, Tim is here tonight with his fiance, Amy, and my daughter, the uh, guitarist. Uh, and here's the present. Here's me as a physician, uh, with my coat on, always smiling. All my scrubs have uh, pinstripes to them, Yankee pinstripes. Here I am uh, with some uh, origami, and then uh, Eddie and I probably drinking in some way. Yeah, there you go. Same thing. I throw in a little bit about 1969, which is our uh, year. This is very interesting. The average cost of the new house, 15,500, now 380,000. The average income, 85,50, now 63,000. The average monthly rent, $135, now 1,100. The average cost of a new car. 3270 now 46 but the most amazing as we see now the cost of gas was 35 yeah. cents yeah. higher than the price I still remember having to turn like the, the gas fights on the corner that was 279 29 but this was the year that was January 12th Joe Naiman Broadway Joe won the first Super Bowl for the uh, AFL uh, it was a great part to, to be Nixon was inaugurated at the 37th president that same time. But the big thing for colleges was, was the Vietnam War, which ne was never, never went over well with the students. And there was a, a lot of uh, revolts at all the college campuses. In July, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, walking on the moon. The famous Beatle album was actually from 1969. The photographer at the Zebra Crossing in London uh, took this on Abbey Road, which became one of the most popular uh, albums ever. Woodstock, 1969, for those older years. Yeah. This summer, some of us went to that, some of us went It's the greatest music festival at the Astros Farm. Again, it was the year of the draft, the first time we had a conscripting draft was 1969, and uh, they made their first drawing of lottery. I was 316. Uh, I don't know what number you were at, but I was 316. Where did you get that chart? I'm not telling you. But this is number one. <laughs> the Mets won their first. <laughs> John Clendenin and Alice. Without that, she went to Palmer Downs. Yeah, and Alice went here, which I didn't know. Next week, actually, it's seven. So just a few closing uh, remarks. Uh, I'm glad you all stayed uh, to listen. Uh, education is your key to success. And at Farmingdale High School, I think you are afforded that. And uh, Jed showing us around tonight, I am just so impressed uh, about the expansive nature and how the AAA education is going here. So despite all of today's 
political world problems uh, for the students to advance education that is aware as they're going to go uh, in life. So once again, thank you for uh, Felicity tonight. Once again, our So, that was awesome. Uh, one of the favorite things I get to do is uh, You know, it's interesting because for me, what's important is uh, it's about these guys, right? Like, so, can we just get a round of applause for these two right here? So, think about you, right? When you were growing up, you were at Dale, right? And you've got 17, 16-year-old kids speaking in front of adults. Our, um, our paper line journalists, that's really hard to do. I watch some of the adults up here getting a little nervous, right? And I think about these kids, but it's unbelievable. And you know, one of the things I, we talk about on this committee is that it's their responsibility to come back and you know, in 10 years when they're eligible, and maybe they can be on this wall, right? Because if you saw tonight, the common thread is really giving back. I mean, so many different people, different stories, different journeys where life takes you, but really, I think at the heart of this community is really about helping one another. Um, I think that's what it means to be a dealer. Um, and so, thank you all for, for being a part of this. Uh, thanks to all of you guys. Really, thank you. I'm, I'm going to miss you at Simon and next year you're going to, she's going to Thomas Jefferson. She wants to be a doctor, so. Yeah. I'm going to here that might be able to help her. I don't know. But she's graduating, so we'll have to replace her, which will not be easy. She's an amazing kid. Um, Mr. Bergson, I got you for one more year, so you're not going anywhere, sorry. So physically, where's the wall? We're going to show you there. It's outside. Um, actually, it's a scavenger hunt. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> it's outside, so there's a plaque. Everyone's got, the, the, the people who won tonight uh, get a copy of what's uh, inscribed on their plaque, and then it's outside. We'll take you there after this. So thank you to all of our speakers tonight. Congratulations to all the winners uh, for this wonderful recognition. Thank you most of all to this community uh, and the members who believe in the power of our Wall of Fame and take the time to nominate deserving individuals for this very special honor. It is not easy. I'm going to tell you right now, it is not, our job is not easy because if we could, we'd probably give out 10 or 15 of these every year um, because there are many deserving people. So thank you to the community who continues to nominate people. Congratulations to our inductees and their families. We are very pleased to add inspirational people to our Wall of Fame this year. We will share your inspirational stories and messages with our students. And this concludes this evening's presentation. Please join us in the comments. We have some light questions. There will be pictures. Uh, Eddie Man's going to sing for everybody once again. And guys, have a great night. Thank you so much.